All right, good morning. All right, good energy. The 930 service was pretty lively today, so I'm expecting a lot out of you. It's good to see you here. It's week number two of our brand new series called Momentum. When you have momentum in your life, you feel unstoppable. If you're going toward a certain goal and you got determination and things start rolling, you feel so good and you feel like you can do it. And so this year, as we begin this year, I know a lot of people begin the new year with a lot of new goals, maybe some resolutions, some things that you want to accomplish in your life this year. And we're asking the question, what role does God play in that? What role does God play in helping you to achieve those goals and get momentum going in your life? And so, you know, as we begin this year, maybe some of you have made a a goal of losing some weight or getting in better shape or making new friends or getting out of debt. Maybe Maybe you want to get married or, or meet someone or have a child this year. Whatever you want to do, whatever those goals are, that's awesome. But what I said last week, I want to remind you of today. God didn't call me here to be a motivational speaker to try to help you achieve all of your goals in life. But I do believe as we dive into God's word, so much of what we look at can actually help you to be motivated in your life and can help you to get momentum in all these areas of your life that you might be thinking about. But today we're going to talk about momentum that's fueled by devotion. So last week we began talking about this idea of momentum, and we said, you know, momentum is important, but we need spiritual momentum in our lives. More than any other type of momentum, we need spiritual momentum. And whenever we say we want momentum, it's because we want to accomplish something, right? Like momentum is toward a goal in our life. Not just momentum for its sake, but momentum toward a goal. So spiritual momentum. Every single one of you, hear me on this, every single person in this room, if you claim to be a believer in Jesus, I can tell you what your ultimate goal is in this life. It is to become more like Jesus. I mean, if you read throughout Scripture, the ultimate goal for a believer is to become more like Jesus. And I asked you this question last week, and maybe you weren't here, or maybe you were, but I want to ask you again, is that something that you want in 2023, to become more like Jesus? Let me hear you. Okay, awesome, because if you do, you're in the right place, because that's something that God wants for you as well. I want it for you. I want it for myself to become more like Jesus. And I know that I need momentum in my life to get there. And there's a scripture that I'm going to keep tethering back to you the entire series, just like this idea of becoming more like Jesus. In the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is speaking to believers, and he says that we should imitate God in everything that we do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. As a child of God, we're supposed to imitate him as much as we can to follow the example of Christ, who was loving. He loved us. He offered himself for us. We're to love others and offer ourselves back to God. So you got to really want it. It, You have to. I can tell you something. (laughs) You're not going to get to January of 2024 and say, I don't know what happened, but this entire last year, I never cracked open the Bible, I never prayed, I never went to church, I never served, I didn't do anything, and I don't know how, but I am so much more like Jesus than I was a year ago. I promise you, that won't happen. You can't accidentally get there, and you can't fake it. It has to happen in you, you have to be motivated. So, momentum begins with motivation. That's what we talked about last week. What motivates you? A lot of times, for me, it's being dissatisfied with myself. There's things I see in myself that I don't like. I asked you last week, how many of you look in the mirror and are dissatisfied? And that's like 95% of us, right? But not just physical appearance, but how are we doing in our lives, in our character, in our walk with God, becoming more like Jesus, And I get dissatisfied. I want to grow. I want to be better. I want to be different. So spiritual momentum begins with God-honoring motivations. Motivation. Motivation has to be there. You're not going to get momentum in your life without some motivation. And last week we talked about four different motivations that are from the Bible that honor God. The first one we talked about was higher level thinking. 
Like if I could start thinking more like God thinks, like Jesus thought, that would make me more like Jesus. Last week we talked about a second motivation of having a can-do attitude. Like the Apostle Paul when he said, I can do all things through Christ. I can overcome whatever obstacle I face in my life because of Christ working in me. A can-do attitude is motivating. We talked about greater influence. Having greater influence this year on the people in our lives, that should motivate us and want us to have some momentum toward the goal of becoming like Jesus. And then the fourth one last week was better character. I just want to be a better person, more like Jesus, have better character, have better integrity in my life. So all those motivating factors can help us to begin the journey toward becoming more like Jesus. And that can give us some spiritual momentum in our lives. But today what we're talking about is what fuels the momentum. So we can get started, but if we don't have any fuel, we're going we're gonna to die out, right? We're not going to make it. We're going to talk about what fuels the momentum today. Last week was about the who. Next week will be about the do, okay? Last week was about who we're becoming, and next week is going to be about what we need to do. But today is about devotion. Devotion is what fuels our momentum. We have to be devoted. Now, the word devotion is not a new word to you. The word devotion, if you look up a definition, you'll see something like this. Love, loyalty, dedication, or enthusiasm for a person or to a cause. Look at that definition. Love, loyalty, dedication, or enthusiasm to a person or for a cause. Who is the person? It's Jesus, okay? Who is the cause? Well, what is the cause? It's Jesus. Jesus is the person. He's the cause. And so I am called to be devoted to him, to have more love and loyalty and enthusiasm and devotion to him. I don't know about you. When I hear those words, love, loyalty, enthusiasm, devotion, I immediately think of another word, time. It takes time to be devoted to anything. And if I want to know what you're devoted to, I look at where you spend your time. I saw an Instagram quote this week somebody put out, and it said, the battle for our hearts is fought on the pages of our calendar. Very revealing, isn't it? What is really important to us is something that gets on our calendar. We're going to do it. We're going to make it happen. What about our devotion to God? See, some of you here today are new on this journey. You're fairly new. You're new on this journey of faith. I mean, you're just kind of, this is your first church. You're just kind of getting started trying to figure it out. Some of you have been around the spiritual block a few times. And you've been to a lot of different kinds of churches different denominations. I say all that because in this room, we have sitting in this room a lot of preconceived ideas and notions of what it means to be devoted to God. You're sitting there, and I'm standing here, and we all got things in our head of what we think it means. Some of you immediately are thinking, what Steve is talking about in this idea of devotion is that I got to spend an hour in a prayer closet in my house every week or every day praying every day for an hour, and I also need to open my Bible and read for an hour every day. Like if I don't read the whole Bible through in the year, I'm not really devoted to God. Some of you, in your mind, when it says devotion, you think, I got to be serving in more ministries in the church, in the community. I got to give more of my time to service, or I got to give more money. I've never given. I'm going to start giving, or I got to give more. I got to do more. I got to give more. I got to be holier got to drop some sin from my life, got to, got to never miss a church service. Some of you think the way to be more devoted is by Christian bling. You know what I mean? <laughs> you need some of those Christian bracelets. You need the Christian t-shirts. You got to get some swag out there at our little store. You got to have church shirts. You got to have, I'm telling you, the car decal on your window you got to get some permanent ink on your body so everybody knows how devoted you are to Jesus, right? That's what it takes to be devoted. And some of you are sitting there thinking, that list is a little overwhelming, and I I can never measure up to all that stuff that you just said. And here's good news. You don't have to. That is not what it's all about. Devotion is not about all those things that I just said. That could be overwhelming. So I want to take you today to our key passage for today. And the cool thing about this passage is it uses a metaphor of the Christian life that fits really well in with this idea of momentum. And it's something you see multiple times in the Bible. And the metaphor is that the Christian life is like running a race. How many of you in here like to run? I know we got some runners in here, okay? 
um, you like to run. When, you, when you're running in a race, of course, you know, the goal is to win. And this idea of running in a race is an idea that really plays well as we understand what it means to follow Jesus and to become more like Jesus in this idea of momentum. Because if you're a runner, you know momentum is a good thing when you're running. So we're going to look at two verses in Hebrews chapter 12 together, beginning with verse number one. The Bible says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So I want to begin with that first phrase of the verse. A huge crowd of witnesses. Those of you that run, maybe you run for yourself. There's probably not anybody here, perhaps, that's running in front of a huge crowd of witnesses. Now, I know if you run in one of the big marathons, there's a lot of people there that are there to cheer you on. But I try to picture this, this scene that we read about here, and I try to picture it in like a stadium and having the, the stands full of people cheering for you. How many of you remember an old movie called Rudy? Anybody, raise your hand if you've ever seen Rudy. Okay. Rudy, as a, as a young man, as a, as a high schooler, his dream was to play football for Notre Dame. He wasn't really sized for that, really wasn't cut out for that, but that was his dream. And eventually, his dream was fulfilled, and everybody knew a little bit about Rudy, and the day that he got on the field, remember, the whole stadium was chanting, Rudy, Rudy. I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like to be him in that moment? If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But just think about this. In your life right now, if you're running this Christian race, trying to become more like Jesus, there's a huge crowd of witnesses that are cheering for you, that are applauding you, that are encouraging you. They want you to go and say, who are they? You're saying there's a huge crowd of witnesses. Well, who is it that's watching me, that's cheering for me? Because I'm not sure who they are. The first word in chapter 12 is the word therefore. Therefore, there's a huge crowd of witnesses. So whenever there's a therefore, you should say, what is it there for? And you go back to say, what happened before that? In chapter 11, it's a chapter that some of you are familiar with, but it's a list of people from the Old Testament that are known for their great faith. And it talks about people like Abraham and Noah and Moses and Rahab and so many others like David and Gideon, and people that are, that are heroes of our faith. And what the writer is saying is that they are cheering for you. Isn't it awesome to think about, I'm running this race and there's people in the stands that are cheering for me and they're, they're, they're the famous people in the Bible. And I like to think of this too, not just them. It says a huge crowd of witnesses. I think there's the people that we know that have gone on before us that have run the race in front of us. Our spiritual role models, our parents and grandparents who lived the life of faith and they're saying, I got there, I finished the race, and you can do it too. And I want you to think about this as we continue this journey with this momentum toward this goal, is that you have people, you might not see them, but they're there. And they're cheering you on, and they want to see you succeed. They want to see you make it to the end. So I'm going to continue going through these two verses. But as we do, I want to point out three different types of devotion that will fuel your momentum. So maybe you got motivated last week, but now you need the fuel to keep going. It's about devotion. The rest of verse 1, he says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. So if we're going to have devotion to fuel our momentum, the first devotion we need is to dropping some weight. Some of you are like, that's my goal for this year. Okay, that's different. All right, I get it. I have that one too. But this idea of dropping some weight, you know if you've ever run in a race that, you know, the less you weigh, probably the better you're going to do. You don't want to be encumbered by extra weight. In sports, we know that you got to get in good shape to compete. And the writer here is saying this spiritual analogy, analogy is for us in this Christian life, this race that we're running. I mean, we have weights and we have sins in our life, they slow us down. So let's talk about sins for a moment because, you know, 
That's a fun topic to talk about, right? All of us are sinners. I am and you are. Here's the thing that maybe you forget or don't realize, just don't think about. The people that I just mentioned that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, these heroes of the faith, they were all sinners too. They were heroes of the faith and their sins are recorded in a book. Aren't you thankful that yours aren't? Most of us probably will never have our sins recorded for people to read about thousands of years from now. But Abraham, hero of the faith, he was a liar. Moses struggled with his temper. You just go through the list. I mean, all of these people. David, he was an adulterer. Solomon was a polygamist. You get even to the New Testament, James and John, those great disciples, they were conniving for position. Peter denied his faith. The Apostle Paul was called the chief of sinners. What I'm telling you is that all of us are flawed, just like the people in the Bible. But what I want to point out is if we're going to run this race, if we're going to achieve this ultimate goal of becoming more like Jesus, I think we need to identify what our, I call it, our signature sin is. What is your signature sin? The one you struggle with the most. What is it? Like if I were to be able to interview God right now, and say, hey, here for Josh, I would like to know what his signature sin is. God would say it. <laughs> Sorry to pick you out. <laughs> no. Probably never coming back. All right. So, so the truth is, you know it right now. In your head, right now, there's a sin that you struggle with more than anything else, and you know it. Here's the thing. What we do, this is so ridiculous. This is what we do. We pick up our signature sins, and we carry them around with us. These are 30-pound dumbbells. Don't be impressed. I got 80s at home. Okay. So anyway... <laughs> Um, I do, I don't use them. But anyway, um, you imagine, and some of you might want me to do this, but if I came off the stage and ran a lap around the perimeter of this auditorium carrying 30 pounds in each arm and tried to run, it would not be pretty. I would be done for the day. I wouldn't, don't snort, it's not that funny. (laughs) But the truth is, you know, if I dropped these and then ran, I could do a lot better. My time would be a lot better. I'd do a lot better at running the race. But here's what's so crazy so really dumb about the way we try to run the Christian life is we carry weights around, these heavy sins, these signature sins, and they slow us down. We're like, I want to achieve what God wants for me this year. I want spiritual momentum, and I'm going to run, but I'm going to hold on to these sins that come in between me and God, but I'm going to hold on to these, yet I'm going to try to achieve what God wants for me this year. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? But what does he say? What does the author say? He says, drop those weights. Put them down. The sin that slows you down. You're like, Steve, you just don't understand. You don't struggle like I do. We all struggle. The Apostle Paul, who wrote more than half of the books of the New Testament, he had that sinking feeling that you have. In Romans chapter 7, he wrote about it. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Man, I feel that. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. And you might say, okay, so we can just excuse it away. Paul isn't excusing it away. He's talking about his experience. But he goes on to talk about how we should deal with our sin. And that when we die to ourselves and have the Holy Spirit in us, we can overcome because of his power working in us, and we don't have to give in. Now, if you're sitting here right now and you're saying, this is all cool for all the sinners in the room, but I don't know if I have any. If you're still not sure what your sins are, we can help you figure it out. (laughs) Write down these passages, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, and Colossians 3. There's lists of sins. Got 10 commandments. If that doesn't work, you can find it. If you still don't know, ask somebody that knows you really well what are your sins, and they can probably tell you. Okay, so we know that we're sinners. We know that. And I believe there's great pleasure in overcoming sin. But I'm not going to stand up here and, and lie to you and say there's no thrill in sin. If there wasn't a thrill, we wouldn't do it. Like I've never heard anybody say, you know what, man, Steve, I hate this. But it's Friday night and I just, I got to go out and sin. I just have to do it. Like you don't do it because you have to. You do it because you want to. There's some pleasure in giving in. It, it feels good in the moment, whatever it is. But there's also that major downside. You know how certain foods are for you? 
like it tastes good. Like I don't even know if Taco Bell tastes good. But I know if I eat it, it's not going to be good for me later. <laughs> like, and as I get older, my digestive system, it seems like it's more of a struggle. Like I love ice cream, but I know I don't feel great later. My mom gave me this quote this week, and she's been on this awesome journey of getting healthy. And she said, nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. Isn't that true? We're not here to talk about dieting today, but that's true. But that applies to this whole idea in the spiritual life. There's this rush and immediate thrill of sin. But there's also this rush to know that I overcame a temptation, something that is my signature sin, and I didn't do it. And I'm like, God, did you see? I just overcame that. I said no. And God's like, yeah, that's why I got my fist there for a fist bump. Come on, let's go. This is awesome. I'm so proud of you. So sin weighs us down. But it's interesting that the author says, get rid of, strip off the weights that slow you down and the sin. So there's sin, but there's also weights that aren't sin. There are some things in our lives that aren't sinful. There's TV and there's hobbies, there's sports. They're not sinful. But we make choices and we we put them as the priority in our life. You know, one of the biggest weights that you have in your life You know how much it weighs? 0.38 pounds. Just over one-third of a pound, less than half a pound, is the thing that gets more devotion in your life than anything else, and that's your phone. That thing that a lot of you have in your hand right now because you're taking notes on our church app, I'm sure, okay? I know. But that phone is good for communication, for taking notes at church, for reading your Bible, I know. But how much time do we spend watching reels and YouTube? How much time do we spend on Instagram and Snapchat? How much time are we wasting on our phones that we don't give that devotion to God? None of the things that we do, like our kids' sports and our golf and our home decor and our biking and our gym time and our video games, they're not evil. They're not sinful things. But do they make it next to impossible to be devoted to God because of how much attention they get? You know, there's nothing that would be unethical for me to say, I am going to run in the next race, the next 5K that comes up. I'm going to run. I'm going to carry this heavy backpack as I run. There's nothing unethical about that. It's just dumb. And we try. We say we want to be more like Jesus, and yet we're not willing to drop some weight. You know why we're fasting together? Do you know, some of you may not know this, we're on a 21-day fast as a church. And over 400 people are involved in that fast. And I'm so excited about that. And I would guess most of you are, are doing that. And it's not because we're just giving up something bad so we can focus on God. We're probably giving up something good, like a certain kind of food we like or a meal of the day. Maybe, you know, giving up TV or, or something in your life that has become more important to you than God. And the whole idea is about focusing on God, being more reliant on God for our fulfillment in our lives. And I know we all do something different. And for me personally, it was hard because at the beginning of the year, I started giving up all these different things food-wise. So I got to January 9th, and I was like, God, what do you want me to give up? And that day, it came to me. God showed me. I spend way too much time listening to sports radio and sports podcasts. Like, I'm, I'm all about it. And God said, instead of that, listen to worship music during that time when you would normally do that, when you're getting ready in the morning, you're at the gym, you got your AirPods in, listen to worship music instead. And it has been an awesome week, I'm telling you. That has changed my perspective every day because I'm doing that and getting my focus back where it needs to be. What are you saying? I'm saying God wants us to identify weights and sins in our lives that slow us down from the race that we're supposed to be running. So your list might be long. So pick out one weight, one sin, Say, God, I'm going to give these to you. I'm going to drop them this week. Let's move on with our passage. Next, he says, let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let us run with endurance. So here's devotion number two. Refusing to quit. Refusing to quit. The no quit attitude. When it comes to my spiritual disciplines, I am not going to quit. There's a lot of reasons people quit. Family pressure. Sometimes your family doesn't mean bad, but they just tell you, you know, you don't need to go. You don't need to do that. You don't have time for that. Sometimes it's financial problems or obligations. It's 
health problems, whatever it is, there's so many reasons that we sometimes feel like quitting. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians, don't get tired of doing what is good. Don't get discouraged to give up, for we will reap a harvest of blessing at the appropriate time. This is hard. There's so many times in our lives where we just feel like giving up. For some of you, a week of victories would go a long way in your spiritual journey. But it's hard to have a week of victories when you can't string two days together. And I know when you start something new, like a new workout at the gym or a diet, like the first couple days getting over that hump and feeling hungry and tired and all that's hard. Just like any journey, though, when you start seeing results in your life, it's worth it. And the same is true spiritually. When you start seeing results, it is absolutely worth it. We're talking about momentum. And for some of you, you know, this week, if you consistently would just win a victory in the areas of your weights and your sins in your life. Because we're talking about having devotion to God that fuels our momentum. So not quitting. So not quitting can fuel your momentum. Just not giving up. Here's a thing that we do. We start a Bible reading plan on January the 1st. And on January 5, 6, and 7, we forget to do it. And then we pull up the app on our phone or however you're doing it, and you're like, you've missed three days. Pfft. Oh, well, I'll try again next year, January 1st, 2024. Don't quit just because you missed a day or two. Sometimes, like, you miss church. You're like, I was going to start off the new year right, and I was sick on the first Sunday of the year, so, well, what's the point? <sighs> Or I hear this a lot of times, I don't really want to go to church because my spouse is sick. I don't want to sit alone. Stop. Stop coming up with excuses not to, not to be in God's house to worship with others. Sometimes people stop giving because they got their January credit card bill from Christmas and like I can't give. Or they quit on serving because they're like, ah, eh, somebody else can do it. I'm tired. Sometimes people want to quit on their marriage because their spouse is just, you know, being difficult or their kids, they want to quit on their kids because they're going through a tough time or people quit on small group because their schedule's busy. I've never heard anybody say the Christian life is going to be easy. Becoming like Jesus is not going to be easy. And there's going to be times where we feel discouraged. There's going to be obstacles from the outside or the inside. It could be your sin and your weights. It could be other people that make you want to quit. Can I just say that sometimes people are jerks? right? People are hurtful, they're rude, and they say things that make you want to quit. Sometimes people are well-meaning, and they say things that make you want to quit the race and throw in the towel on your spiritual goals. Do not let them. Be realistic, but keep in mind that you need perseverance in your life. I remember um, one of my mentors in college, when I was going into ministry, when he would preach, he said this many times. He said, a man's greatness is measured not by his talent or by his wealth, but by what it takes to discourage him. So just don't give up when times are hard. When you're having a week where you messed up, where you gave in, where you didn't do what you should, don't quit just because of that. How do we fuel our momentum? It's devotion. It is absolute devotion to God. Dropping some weight, refusing to quit, and then the rest of the passage he says this, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. So devotion number three, very simply, is focusing on Jesus. What is your focus? What is it that you're focused on in this life? If you are not focused on Jesus, you're not going to run this race very well. And here's the problem. A lot of us, when we become believers, we are focused on Jesus, and we know that's important. And all of us in this room have some sense of focus on Jesus because, hey, you're in church today. You're here. You made the effort. So it's part of your life. But what I want to say to you is what happens to so many of us is Jesus is our focus. He's out there in the distance. But he gets blurry because our focus right in front of us are things like wealth, money, having more possessions, comfort in our lives, or worldly success, that becomes very clear and Jesus is blurry. He's there, but he's blurry because what matters to me is my job, my status, what people think of me in my community. For some of us, it's like what's really clear in my focus is my, is my kid's success because how my kids do in sports and in school and in music, whatever they're involved in, that gives me something to brag about 
And that's my focus at this period of time in my life. Jesus is there, but it's kind of blurry. He's kind of blurry. You know, having friends, like social media friends, having friends and persons when I'm in my friend group, you know, I'm the funny one that people laugh at and, and think I'm cool and I have a good appearance and I look good. Like that's my clear focus. Jesus is kind of blurry in the background. And for some, it's even like my, my focus is on, on being religious, you know, going to church, checking that box. People are impressed by that. But that's not Jesus. Jesus isn't clear. He's blurry. Momentum is fueled by focusing clearly on Jesus as the most important thing. So what does it mean to focus on Jesus? Paul said it this way. Philippians 3, he said, Dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all that I should be, but I am focusing all of my energies on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race, that analogy of a race again. He said, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us up to heaven. All of my energies, Paul said, are on becoming more like Jesus. Like, we got to be all in. We have to be all in if it's going to happen in our lives. It can't be a halfway commitment. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's our example. He's our model. He's our champion. The ultimate goal of every believer, I'm going to keep saying it, going to keep tethering back to it, is to become like Jesus. If you were a young boy, Growing up, and you love basketball, like when you were, you were my age, you know, you're looking at like Michael Jordan, like I want to be like Mike. Remember that? Younger kids like LeBron, and there's other younger great basketball stars that are out there. You kind of like have somebody you want to be like when you're young, and you look at them, and you focus on them, like what do they do? What do they say? How do they act? And you kind of follow that, right? If we're going to become like Jesus, how is it going to happen if we're not focusing on him? learning what he was like and what he did and not getting distracted from that goal. You know, Jesus, he came with a purpose. He came with a purpose to seek and save the lost and to die as a sacrifice for our sin. He knew what his purpose was, but there was people that tried to distract him. So we're on a 21-day fast where we're giving up something. Jesus went on a 40-day fast in the wilderness with no food for 40 days. And the end of that 40 days, the devil came to him and tried to tempt him to sin. And you remember what the devil said? He said, there's these stones right here. Why don't you turn these stones into bread so you can eat? You know what Jesus did? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't get into a discussion with the devil and say, well, what kind of bread are you talking about? <laughs> Panera bagels and muffins or like Olive Garden breadsticks? I mean, there's a lot of good bread options. He didn't do that. Because... Temptation, the battle, is won in the first five to ten seconds, isn't it? So right away, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus had a quick answer, so the devil just immediately left. No. The devil said, I'm going to try again. Tempted him a second time. Jesus did the same thing, and then a third time. And then finally the devil went away. But that's going to happen in your life. You're going to be tempted to get off track. The Pharisees tried to get Jesus off track as well. They tried to always get him hung up on these non-essentials from the Old Testament. And Jesus kept going back to know, this is why I'm here. This is my purpose. My purpose is to, to love. My purpose is to sacrifice myself for the sins of the world. Jesus didn't get off purpose. And we in our lives, if we are going to achieve this ultimate goal as a believer, to become more like Jesus, we can't get off of our focus. We can't be distracted but all the other options, the number one focus in our lives needs to be focusing on Jesus. Momentum is an incredible feeling toward a goal. The ultimate goal of every believer is to become more like Jesus. Spiritual momentum begins with God-honoring God -honoring motivations like we talked about last week. But the fuel comes from the devotion in our heart to him. So where's your devotion? What are you devoted to? As we close today, I want to challenge you to think of these three devotions that we talked about in this passage. And they all apply to all of us. Maybe it's easier to focus on one. So one, for you, which, which one is it? Is it dropping some weight? For some of you, it's a sin or another weight in your life that is just taking too much attention away from God. Maybe it's dropping some weight. 
For some of you, that, that, that is not at all what it is. It's refusing to quit. It's this feeling you have that you want to throw in the towel. That's where you are right now, but that needs to be the number one thing in your life that you focus on this week is, God, help me not to quit. And then for some of you, it's number three. It's focusing on Jesus. Like you, you have sin and you have wanted to quit, but really right now, the problem for you is you're focusing on all these other things in this world that aren't necessarily bad, but Jesus is blurry. And in your life right now, if you know that you want to do what we all said, yeah, we want to do this, we're going to be more like Jesus, if you really, really want that in your life, then he's got to be the number one focus in your life. Let's pray. As we go to God in prayer, just take a moment to just think about where you are in your relationship with God. The band's going to come back on the stage and close us with a song. But as they get ready for this closing song, I want you to just think as, as I pray here in a moment, what is it that God is speaking to you about? Which one of these devotions is the, is the one that's most lacking in your life right now? Is it the focus? Is it this, this, this idea of quitting too easily? Is it weight or sin in your life? Let's just take a moment. Let's talk to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence here this morning with us. God, for those that are sitting right now in this room that have a sin, that signature sin in their life that they're that they're thinking about, they're struggling with, God, help them to drop it this week. Help them to have a week of victory, a week of not giving in to that sin. And then help them to build upon those victories. God, for those that are sitting here today that are in the mode where they're thinking about quitting, people have said things, they feel like a loser, they feel like they can't do it. God, help them to know that you believe in them. God, there's a huge crowd of witnesses that are cheering for them. Help them to believe that they should keep going and not quit. And Father, I, I just pray for those in this room, God, that have gotten their focus on so many other things but you. Lord, help them to refocus, to make you the most important thing in their life. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for all you've done in our lives. Be with us now as we close the service in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.